Uh, well, good morning, everybody, or early afternoon almost. Uh, my name's Tucker with the Alumni Association. Uh, for those of y'all haven't met before, just want to say welcome and thank you for joining us today on this uh, wonderful afternoon. Zoom call with uh, the Saints organization. We have luckily with us today, Jeff Ireland and Caroline Gonzalez. So we're excited to have both of them here to talk with us today. Um, I want to say a special thanks to Leslie Saloom for working to get this set up with the Saints organization. Um, and a special thanks to RCAF and the Alumni Association who helped participate by sponsoring this today. Um, just want to kind of tell you all a little bit that the association is here for you. If you are not a member of the association, we ask that you join us. Um, one of the perks of being a member is that you get to join things like this beforehand early. Um, and so with that being said, I'm going to throw it over to Hans and let him do a brief intro from RCAF and get started. Yeah, good morning. Appreciate you guys joining us. So glad you're here. Um, just wanted to say thank you uh, for taking the time uh, to be with us and also want to wish everybody well. We know it's a crazy time and, and everybody's sacrificing and doing things different, uh, but we're going to be together again soon. I know you did not come on to hear from me, so I'll kick it on to Leslie so we can get started. Thank you all again for joining us. Hi. Okay, we're just going to go over a quick um some, some quick points about Zoom etiquette for those of you who aren't familiar. So um, upon entry, all of your microphones were muted. We ask that you keep it that way um, until the question and answer portion. And at that time, we'll call on individuals to ask their questions. You can submit those questions through the chat feature, which should be located um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So, so feel free to submit your questions throughout the conversation. And um, when it comes to that time, we will, uh, we will call on you to ask your question. Um, I think that's all I've got. So I will turn it over to Caroline Gonzalez with the Saints um, and you can take it from there. Hey everyone, uh, as Leslie said, I'm Caroline. I am the broadcasting coordinator with the New Orleans Saints and Pelicans. Uh, if you don't know, the Saints and Pelicans are under one roof. Uh, so I work for both teams. I am a native of Dallas, Texas. I graduated from Loyola, New Orleans after playing women's basketball there for four years. Uh, you will be happy to know that I did play ULL during one of my years there, my freshman year and the Raging Cajuns did win. Unfortunately, I didn't play a lot, so you can't blame that on me. I was a freshman, so uh, I didn't play a lot, so you can't blame that one on me. But uh, I went to Loyola and then eventually ended up working for the New Orleans Saints and Pelicans as their broadcasting coordinator. So uh, I do our Saints pregame and postgame shows on our digital platforms. I do our podcast three times a week. And then on the Pelican side, uh, I'm involved in our sideline radio reporting and with our production as well. So, uh, but you didn't come to hear about me. We will introduce the man of the hour, uh, Jeff Ireland. Jeff, thanks for coming on. Why don't you give yourself a little intro and, and background? Yeah, so I'm Jeff Ireland. I'm the assistant GM and college scouting uh, director for the New Orleans Saints. This is, uh, this will be going into my sixth season. Uh, this is my 25th year in the National Football League. I uh, started with um, uh, the National Football League Combine, and then, and then I got a job with the Chiefs as an area scout. And then I went over to Dallas Cowboys, spent seven years as a Cowboy as a vice president uh, with the Cowboys. And then I went, uh, spent six years as the general manager of the Miami Dolphins. Um, I took one year off in that 25 years, and then I've been here for the last, well, going on six years. So uh, my role is uh, whatever Mickey tells me to do. Um, but more, more importantly, I handled the draft. Uh, I've handled the draft since I've been here. Um, I help out with, you know, with some free agency. Um, you know, issues when it comes to, uh, you know, filling the roster, but uh, more than anything else, I'm just really here for uh, a voice of reason, someone to bounce ideas off. I've been in that chair before. Uh, Sean and uh, Sean Payton and I have a previous relationship when we were at the Cowboys together, and Sean's, uh, you know, probably uh, greatly responsible for me being here. Jeff, can I ask how you even got into scouting in the first place? I don't think that's something that when you're little, you say, oh, I want to be a doctor. I want to be blah, blah, blah. How did you become a scout in the first place? Well, it's, it's kind of a long story. And so I got a football family. So I'm from West Texas. I grew up uh, born in Lubbock, Texas, raised in Abilene, Texas. I played football, uh, went to school as a four-year starter at Baylor University. But more than anything else, my mom and uh, my parents were divorced. And so when I was young, my mom would ship me off to be with my grandparents. And my grandfather was the director of college scouting for the Chicago Bears for 35 years. And so when I went up to be with my grandparents, I just started being a ball boy at the age of 11 or 12 years old. And so if you don't have any history of the Chicago Bears, 
during that era. That would have been the 80s. So uh, I was around the 85 Bears with probably the greatest team in NFL history. Um, maybe the greatest defense in NFL history. Maybe the, not the greatest team. But anyway, um, I was around all those players for all those years. Uh, I fell in love with football. Um, and then my mom actually remarried a, a gentleman by the name of E.J. Holub. And he was the first uh, – first pick for the Dallas Texans back when the AFL started, which became the Dallas, excuse me, the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, he was an All-American at Texas Tech. And so that was right at the end of my high school career. So all through, all through my professional career, I've had my grandfather, who's now deceased, and then my stepfather, who's also deceased. But I had all those people surrounding me with, with all these football, uh, football greats for, for, that, uh, for that period of my life and just kind of fell in love with football. For those of you that don't know, the, the draft this year was conducted completely virtually. Everyone was in their own homes. Everything had to be done via a uh, WebEx conference call, just like we're doing now. So it was a little bit or a lot different uh, than years past. Jeff, can you touch on a little bit about how the process of this year's draft went and maybe just maybe some hiccups? <laughs> yeah, you know, so it was completely different. Obviously, we were isolated in our own, um, our own homes. But I'll, I'll, I'll back up to – just kind of the process of scouting. So, you know, look, I would say 75, 80% of scouting is done while we're playing, like when our team's playing. When college football is playing football, our scouts are scouring the country, uh, evaluating football players as they play as they play games, while they're at practice. We visit, we visit a, pretty much a school a day uh, throughout the fall. And then we come into December, right, right at the end of uh, college football season, we meet. We try to carve out, carve off the fat, just try to concentrate on the guys that we really want to concentrate on. And then we go into bowl game season, senior bowl, East West, national, or the um, NFLPA game. And then we, after all that's done, we go into a meeting in February with, uh, with Coach Payton, Mickey, myself, and all the scouts. And then we really, really trim it. And we get it down to about 200 players. And then all the juniors come out. Um, and we talk about those players. And then we go to the combine. So we got to meet pretty much and get all this information pretty much done. Our board, I always say, look, at the end of that February meeting, I want to be able to draft if, if something terrible happens. I want to be able to, to draft at the, at, before we go to the combine. And why that's important is I want to draft them off being football players, not, not, not just athletes in shorts. So, um, for the first time in 25 years, it actually came to fruition. Uh, we go to the combine. Our scouts were on the road for about 10 days doing pro days and such. And then we had, then we were completely shut down. And so all these pro days that we would normally go to, and then we get 30 players that we can go and, and bring into New Orleans to get a really a thorough look on. Uh, we kind of kind of call it the top 30, but it's not necessarily top 30. The guys that we want to recruit guys that we have maybe a mental question on. Um, so we'll bring all those kids in. And we didn't get to do that either. And then our coaches, we send them out for about six or seven priority pro days that I want them to go to to get to know the kid a little bit better, more, a little bit more intimate setting, take them to dinner, get a little football in the locker room or in the, in the meeting room, and then maybe a little bit of social. We didn't get to do that either. So we kind of had to circle the wagons a little bit. We had to get into the WebEx uh, world. I've learned more about Wi-Fi upload, download speeds than you can think of. Um, I know why these, these calls are successful and why they're not successful because of Wi-Fi speed. Um, but we look, we got pretty good at it. And I think there's a lot of things that, um, that came out of that time period that we'll start using uh, in the future. Some WebEx meetings and things like that that uh, you know, the players are a little bit more comfortable when they're in their own home setting. And we got a lot of good feedback from the kids um, from that perspective. So, um, and then the great thing is, is that uh, we got to, um, for a short period of time, we got to go to the Dixie Brewery and, and host, you know, me, Mickey, and Sean were able to be there. And, you know, the three decision makers in the draft were all, you know, able to be together. Oh, for you know, a week to 10 days, however long it was, and to meet on players. And we had, we had 12 monitors. We're, we're trying to WebEx or Zoom, you know, video back to our scouts and to our coaches. Um, and it, was, it was very productive. Um, 
but that was that was different. Not being able to see a scout's facial expression, a coach's facial expression, um, not be able to see kind of the the real passion that that they have for a player. Sometimes we had audio, you know, issues that we you know, it was breaking up and we couldn't hear them, and that got a little bit frustrating. And you know, so it kind of became you know me, Mickey, and Sean just really kind of huddling together, making sure we we had everything we needed. Um, from a decision-making standpoint. And then when the Dixie Brewery kind of broke up, um, you know, we had to go isolate at our, at our own homes. And we built these pretty elaborate uh, draft rooms, which was pretty cool. We had monitors everywhere. We had draft boards. We had magnetic boards. We had, gosh, we had uh, all kinds of screens going on. Um, and each of us had those rooms. And um, uh, it was uh, – it actually went off a lot easier than uh, than we thought it would be. We thought it was going to be kind of a, a cluster, but it, it was actually very productive and thoroughly. Actually, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the draft this year, kind of seeing a bunch of my colleagues, friends, buddies, uh, and their kids that I haven't haven't seen in, in 10 or 15 years. So it was a, a, a pretty cool experience. Jeff, has it been kind of crazy to see the evolution of scouting? Because you think about scouting before and now, you just said you're checking social media, you're doing WebEx calls. You're, there's so many different changes in scouting. Has it been challenging at all, at all, or has it kind of been impressive? Actually, it's been both. Um, you know, like I wouldn't, I'm not going to pretend to say I'm this real tech savvy person. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on Twitter, I'm not on anything social media wise. Um, you know, so, and all my scouts are, so I kind of rely on them to, to, you know, search through social media. And then we hire a, a service that allows us to get kind of behind the curtain on someone's social media account. And we rely on that. Uh, gosh, when I started scouting, my grandfather put me in the dark room of his upstairs office. And then we're, you know, he's teaching me how to, you know, um, you know filter through the, the, the 16 millimeter tape you know, and get that, uh, that projector going. And so, and now we're, uh, now we're streaming video on a computer and uh, we all can see the same thing at the same time. It's, uh, it's really crazy. I think the next thing is going to be a 4D video football field on my dining room table. I have no doubt about that. Um, Jeff, how would you say that you've set yourself apart in, in the scouting world? Because you're kind of a hidden gem when it comes to the New Orleans Saints. Not a lot of people would pick you out of a lineup if they were at the grocery store, whereas if they saw Mickey or Sean, they might. But how have you set yourself apart in the scouting world? Well, you know, that's a hard question to talk about yourself. Look, I, I just try to try to stay humble in, in, our, in our approach. Um, I love what I do. I have a, I have extremely high passion for football. I actually love coming to work. Um, I've got a 40 minute commute to the office and I get up every morning, I get a workout in early and I get on the road and I drive in and I got a smile on my face and I love what I do. I love the people I work with. Uh, Mickey and Sean are fantastic. Miss Benson, uh, and everybody else. So look, I think, you know, more than anything is just, um, is 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 trying to having the the philosophy that that no stone goes unturned, and, and and keeping the same approach. Every single day we're in draft meetings, and and we don't cut any corners. If we have to watch until 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, my. Is Jeff frozen for anyone else? I think he's frozen. He's frozen. All good. This has happened. We're in a virtual world. Okay, Jeff, you're you're unfrozen now. Go ahead. Sorry about no, that. No problem. So I was just saying that um, you know, well, look, we we just we 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 believe in our in our process. We believe in our philosophy, and and we're very thorough at it. And um, you know, that's really how we've set ourselves apart. And look, we the, the group of guys that that we have, we have a lot of continuity in our scouts and. I trust them. I trust them wholeheartedly. Uh, when they say this guy's not the kind of guy that we want in our locker room, um, then he's probably not the kind of guy we want in our locker room. And we believe in character. We believe in, uh, you know, we believe that our locker room needs to be a good locker room and, and high character. And and um, and we believe we, we don't really believe that exceptions uh, are going to make the difference. So we just again, it goes back to the philosophy that. 
that uh, you know Mickey and Sean and my son, and um, and we've we've stayed the course. Jeff, not that you know all the dark secrets of all the other war rooms, but would you say in your time that you've noticed that the Saints do something uniquely or different than other teams maybe do? Well, I've been with four, call it five teams. I did consult the year I was out of football. I did consult with the Seahawks. So I've seen, I've seen five different draft rooms. And then when you go into, some, go into a place, you've actually seen what they did prior to your arrival. So I've seen – you know, the Dallas Cowboys operate before I got there, how they operated. I've seen the Miami Dolphins operate before I got there. And then I've seen the Saints and the Seahawks. And, and look, I do think we do something uniquely different. Um, and, and that is we don't really care what other teams are doing. We believe in what we do and because we, we believe that it's the right way of doing things. And so when we carve our board down to – a minimal amount of players. Um, some people that will that that can make people nervous, you know, because there's 256, 257 play, or players players going to be drafted, and you look up at our board and we got 115 players. So there's more players going to be off our board than are that are on our board going to be drafted. So it just goes in the belief that we have that we've done the work, and those players that are on our board, by God, they're they're for us. And I think that's what's different because I've seen a lot of boards that have 250 to 300 players on the board, and that's uniquely different than what other teams do. You've been around Drew Brees for some time now, and we're going to ask you for your best story of Drew Brees. And, and don't forget, if you haven't already, go ahead and head over to the chat and enter your questions. We're going to get to a few of them here shortly. But, um, Jeff, go ahead and with your best story of Drew Brees. Well, I hate to be long-winded, but it, this is a little bit of a buildup. So when I got here, we've had this really strenuous conditioning test. And it's, it's four quarters. I've tried it once. I got through one quarter of it. Now, I'm, I'm no professional athlete, but it's, 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 a, it's a booger now. So and in each spring, Sean has a competition for, for the teams. So he puts – the whole team, the 90-man roster, into these six or seven player groups, okay? And then they goes off on a scavenger hunt. And he goes off on a fishing, you know, extravaganza. But it's the whole team. And there's going to be one winner at the end, one, one group team that's going to win the whole thing. And so the winner gets a conditioning chip. It's a poker chip. And so when it comes to training camp, you can turn that conditioning chip into, well, you can sell it. And it's gone as much as $15,000 for an offensive lineman that doesn't want to take the conditioning chip. Or you can just say, I'm not going to take, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm not, you know, look, this is my chip. I'm turning in my chip. I'm not going to have to do the conditioning test. So Drew, of course, he wins the competition this spring and comes to training camp. We're going to the Greenbrier. And instead of doing a conditioning test this year, we, uh, there was a big flood up there. And we decided we're going to do a community service event in, in lieu of the conditioning test. So the next spring comes around. So they didn't get the user condition chip. So the next spring comes around. Sean breaks them into, uh, into groups. Of course, Drew Brees' team wins the competition again. So there's now there's 10 or 15, 10, we call it 12, 13 chips that are now in circulation for the conditioning test come in August. Drew owns two of them, right? Here comes the conditioning test, and Drew's getting warmed up. He's getting loosened up. He's stretching. And he does a conditioning test. Now, everybody knows that Drew's an amazing quarterback, but what Drew gets criticized in is maybe not being the, you know, the biggest, the fastest, or strongest. He finishes second of all the 90 players on the roster. Cam Jordan, who I think is an unbelievable elite athlete, he finishes first. Drew, over a four quarters, is about three seconds behind him. Now, he's 40 years old. Here all he's competing in Taysom Hill, who he kicked his butt in that one, who I think is an amazing athlete. And so at the end, I'm out there, all the coaching staff's out there, and we're kind of making sure that each player um, is doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing in this test because they're, they're in big groups. So I'm in, I'm in, I'm in Drew's group, and I, so I, afterwards I asked him, I said, look, you had two conditioning tests or chips. You had two conditioning chips. Why, why, did, why did you do the conditioning test? 
He said, Jeff, he goes, what, what kind of leader would I be if I didn't do the conditioning test? I, I said, true. He goes, I said, well, you could have sold it. You know, I'm thinking, you know, you're going to get $10,000 or 15 grand. Well, Anders Pete never, never, never passes a conditioning test. You can sell it to him. He goes, nah, he goes, look, I don't want to take anybody's money and I don't need the money. And, and I think everybody needs to be doing the conditioning test. So here it is. It's about the competition for him. It's about, it's about getting everybody ready for the season. And look, I've always known that Drew was an amazing quarterback. You see it on tape. He amazes me in everything he does. But that day I was like, wow, he's really thinking of everything. He's thinking of leadership. He's thinking of camaraderie. He's thinking of, you know, making sure the team is ready. And uh, I learned a little bit about Drew Brees that day that, uh, you know, look, he, he wants to win every competition he's in. He's pissed that Cam Jordan won't beat him. It's like it's those, it's like that team event in the spring. He's, he's probably won, you know, since I've been here, he's probably won three or four out of the last five. So it's incredible. But uh, that's the best story that I've got. Um, guys like me, the, these football junkies like myself love that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think leader is the first word that comes to, to mind when I th think of Drew. And it's funny, you can't tell the difference in his face between when he's determined and he's in the middle of something or when he's pissed off. He always kind of has that just very focused face at all times. Um, so that's very interesting. We're going to go ahead and open it up to Q&A, Jeff. Uh, we're going to ask each person to unmute themselves when I call on your name. Uh, we're not going to be able to get to every question, but we're going we're gonna to cover a few here. We're going to go first to Mike Abear. Mike Abear, why don't you ask your question that you asked in the chat. Mike, are you with us? Can you unmute yourself? Let's see. Mike, you're unmuted if you want to ask your question. Let's see. If not, Caroline, do you want to ask yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah, I can go ahead and ask it. Sorry, my dog is freaking out right now because someone just got home. Uh, Jeff, describe a time when you and Sean. Live video conferencing, you love it. Love this. I'm gonna get this out. Describe a time when you and Sean disagreed on a potential draft choice and how was it resolved? Uh, well, he's gonna win that argument. Let's just be honest. Um, you know, I can't recall, I can recall a couple of different circumstances where there was going to be an argument, um, but none that I can think of that we actually had an argument. You know, on draft day, those arguments have already been argued. Um, the arguments come in February when we're, when we're first sitting down and we're, when we're talking about a player, or maybe in April when we're, we're going through with the coaches. Um, I think that's the greatness of our rapport is that we don't really argue too much. Uh, we were raised and, and, um, and, and tutored by the same guy, Bill Parcells. And so we think that a lot of light, we think character is, is extremely important. And, um, you know, I think if there's any kind of arguments, it's about, it's about the makeup of the player. It's, you know, he may, he may discuss he may see the athlete so great that maybe we might we might take a risk on on the makeup and and and, and quite frankly my philosophy may be I hear like I'd rather hit the double than than strike out um you, you might hit a home run or you might strike out I don't, I don't like those odds so I might say look I'd rather go with this other guy and hit the hit a, and, and hit for sure double and hit a double every single time versus go after a, a home run that might strike out. And those, those typically are maybe the arguments that are in, that had in, in maybe February or, or April. All right, we'll try this one again. Uh, Lyle Landry, if you want to ask your question, you'll be unmuted here. Lyle, go ahead. Sure, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, Lyle. All right, hey, hey Jeff, how's it going? Well, well man. Um, can you describe maybe how often you evaluate and update your prototypes based on like league trends? I can. Uh, great question. So prototype, I'll just ex ex explain to the group. Prototypes are what we look at is uh, height, weight, speed, arm, and hand. And so it's a basic, 
uh, measurements, minimum standards to each position that we look at. Um, you know, so we have a, a height, a weight, a speed, an arm, and a hand measurement for every single position. And we call that prototype. And so what we do for prototype is we take every player, every starting player in the league every single year. And we do it after the draft. We'll do it this time of the year. We'll update it. And so we'll get every starter. And then we'll see what the average is for the starter. And so that's prototype. If you're, if you're, if you're within, and then we'll, we'll, we'll come down a little bit and we'll have a minimum standard for that, for that. And we'll call that prototype. So anyway, any, between the minimum standard and the average is what we call prototype. And we remeasure that and recalculate that on an everyday basis, excuse me, every year basis, not every day. But we use that and we type, we type players based on height, weight, speed, and arm and hand actually. And so um, I can just, so my scouts can say he's an I. So it's a one letter, an I means he's, he's got prototype height, weight, and speed. Or he's an I with an L at the end of the grade. And I'll say, well, he's, he's an I, he's got height, weight, speed, but yet he's, he's, miss, he's missing a, an arm or a hand measurement. And so when I'm looking up at the board and so I've got a, 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 an I-224 L, I know exactly what that means. Um, he's a prototype, he's in the second round, and he's got an L, which means he's, he's, he's lacking either arm or hand, depending on that position, which, which um, is more important, is the hand more important to, the, to that position or the arm length? Good question, Lyle. That's a lot of letters, Jeff. Uh, this next one is going to be from Ryan. Ryan, there's no last name on here, but if you ask a question in the chat, go ahead. Oh, Ryan, we can't hear you. I don't know if your audio is not connected. I know you're unmuted, but. Ryan, you're unmuted if you want to ask your question. Uh, I think he's having some audio issues. Ryan, I'm going to go ahead and ask your question if you don't mind. Uh, Jeff, are there any lessons you learned from your time as a Dolphins GM that you've applied to success with the Saints? Well, yeah, look, I learned a lot of lessons in Miami. Uh, we don't have time to go over all the lessons I learned in Miami. Um, and really, they're, they're not just one or two. Look, you know, I became the youngest GM in the league when I took over the Miami Dolphins with Coach Parcells. And – there's really no manual in our profession that they give you when you become a GM. And uh, so you're learning a lot on your own. You're learning a lot. You know, the first time it hits your desk is the first time you've ever seen that problem or, or challenge. And so there's a lot of learning on the go. Um, so in my profession, you, in this profession, to be a GM, you either come up on the salary cap side of things, or you come up on the personnel side of things. It's one of the reasons Mickey and I marry so well together because Mickey kind of came up more on the salary cap side and I came up on the other side, which is personnel. And so we marry very well together. We match very well together in our thought processes. And so when you become a GM, you've probably come through the ranks of one of those two. And I came up through the ranks of personnel. So all of my career, I've been watching players, making decisions on, on, on draft choices, making decisions in free agency when I was with the Cowboys. Your team building. And some of the mistakes that I made in some, you know, at the Dolphins um, were not necessarily team building mistakes. They're, 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 they're these, ans there's these ans outside ancillary issues that, 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 can that came upon me. And so, um, Look, there's too many to mention, but, um, you know, I, I really, as it, as it relates to personnel, I've really kind of honed those skills and become much more philosophically convicted uh, in how to pick players um, since those times in Miami. That answers your question. Uh, we're going to go ahead to Dr. Banner. Dr. Banner, you're going to be unmuted if you want to ask your question. Dr. Banner, you are unmuted. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for joining us. What a treat. Thank you, 
I can hear you, so go ahead. Uh, again, it's uh, taken enough and away from the Saints management. Um, there's been a calming influence, it seems, since you've joined the team, which I think has led to a, 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 the success in recent years in the draft. So it's so great to have you on board with management. My question is uh, regarding this particular draft. Um, one, if Ruiz was your target all along at 24, were y'all uh, considering possibly trading back at all, or were you concerned? I was particularly looking at Miami at 26 with somebody else uh, possibly snagging him. And secondly, it was reported that all three guys, your first three picks were all in your top 40. Can you, and this is a long shot, but can you share where you had each of those guys ranked on your board, which is really the only board that matters when y'all are doing the drafting? Well, Doc, thanks for your comments. Um, as it relates to the draft, so this year, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of um, a lead up. So we knew going into this draft that we weren't going to have an off-season program. Uh, the NFL offices are all closed. So our coaches aren't able to bring, you know, come in and meet with our players like we've done for forever. And so the buildings are closed. Our players can't come in. Our coaches can't develop players. And more than anything else, this is a developmental league. We have to develop our players. And so kind of going into the draft, we felt like if we can't do those things, then we need to make sure and know and know we know that the players that we draft can make a difference on our roster. So we, we really felt like we had a couple – we had some targeted guys that could come in – compete for either a starting position or an, or an immediate contributor position at some, at some knee positions. And so generally that goes against my philosophy and say, hey, look, let's, let's take best player. Um, we, we did feel like Ruiz, uh, Ruiz was the best player on our board when we picked him. Um, so it fits both philosophies. Uh, we had pretty good intel um, that Miami um, and certainly Kansas City at 32 would take Ruiz. Um, and so we did, tr we did attempt to trade back, but then when we got some of that intel, we decided that, look, we just need to take this player and, and just be satisfied that that guy's going to come in and immediately start for a starting position. The makeup was so high on this kid that you just couldn't, you couldn't turn it down. Look, he's one of, so there's a, there's a coach um, named Juan Castillo that was uh, with Michigan last year. He's, he's got 30 years of coaching offensive line in this league. And so he, for the one year he's at Michigan, I think he's somewhere else now, maybe with the bears, maybe. Um, but we got a hold of him, and, and, and he talked. He's the smartest offensive lineman he's ever coached, uh, one of the smartest. Uh, he's, he's one of the most competitive guys he's ever been around. Uh, so we love that when we hear that from a, from a player. And then you watch the tape, and he's outstanding. He's so consistent. He's got these huge hands. Inside interior offensive linemen, you would think that arm length would be the most important thing, but it's actually hand size. So it's basically – how much hand size you can get on someone's chest. It's, you know, so, and that's what this guy does. Uh, he can snap it and then he can get his off hand up on a guy's chest really quickly. Um, and then when you go to Zach Bond and, and Adam Troutman, same thing applies with both of those players in terms of their makeup, their football intelligence, their competitiveness, their passion for the game. Um, look, I, I think, either Sean or Mickey must have said something about them being in our top 40. Um, and that may be true. I don't really exactly remember exactly where they were at. I, look, I know we both had them pretty, all, all three of those players we had really high. Um, and we got good value from them. We got one in the third round, one in the bottom of the third round. And based on where we had them, that's a really good value. That's why we traded up. We don't want, we wouldn't trade up for a third round player. We trade up for players that, that we're going that we feel like we're gonna get great value from, and um, and we're excited about those three players in particular because of their makeup, um, 
because of their competitiveness, because we feel like and feel strongly about they're going to come in right away with that, with all that's going on, with no off season program, no coach development. We'll obviously have some, some virtual football intelligence stuff that the coaches will be doing, but not face to face, not one-on-one. Um, and then look, I, I'll be honest, I'd be remiss to say if I didn't, if I didn't fall in love with Tommy Stevens, the, the seventh round pick, um, he was a six, four, 250 pound, four, six, um, quarterback and he's got an unbelievable set of athletic tools um i see him i do see him being a little bit of a Taysom hill type type athlete that um that might play multiple positions for us all right we have time for two more questions with jeff uh the first one's going to go to marine ryan if you want to go ahead and ask your question hey jeff thanks for joining us I'll be quick before my kids start screaming. Yeah, Ryan. The, uh, the Saints, historically, we've had a draft strategy of trading up and targeting players. You talked about that. Um, you know, we usually end up with, with six, five, six picks, uh, kind of on average. Uh, but it can also be argued some of the Saints' best drafts in 2006 and 2017 have been when the Saints have possessed a large quantity of draft picks um, so one school of thought is trade away picks, go acquire some coveted players. And another school of thought is to accumulate draft picks to give your team more chances and opportunities to hit. So what are your just general thoughts on those two draft philosophies and, and, uh, and how that plays out in the Saints organization? Thank you. Well, in particular, great question, by the way. And if you are a Marine, thank you for your service, Ryan. Um, Look, there's two different philosophies. Okay, so 2006, I wasn't with the Saints, but they were rebuilding. And so you have a roster that needs um, quantity more than maybe quality. You need quality, but you need some quantity too because you have a lot of holes to fill. Um, I would say in 2017 that our mindset going into the draft was a little bit, we had some holes to fill. We, we needed more quantity than quality now we were able to get a lot of quality just like the 2006 draft a lot of quality um, but as you build a team as you build a roster as we've built now here we are we're going to be in the 2020 season you don't want to be drafting players that you know are not going to make your roster and when you have very few holes to fill and this is a great place to be on a roster then you got to be a little bit more strategic on going after players that you know can help and you know they can come in right away and contribute. And we just kind of felt like this year was, was really unique because of the lack of off season, as I said before, lack of that developmental uh, period of time that we felt like we needed to be a little bit more strategic in going after different players. There's lots of different ways to skin a, skin a cat in our business. There's lots of different ways to, to conduct a draft. And those are two philosophies that we talk about a lot. Look, as a scout at heart, the more, the more draft picks, the better. Um, but as you, as you have to take a look at your roster, you have to really be specific on and, and really know your roster and know the players that are coming out in the draft. I think we do a very good job of that. And uh, that's why we, we, we went with fewer picks this year. All right, last question is going to go to Angel Pierce. I have a lot of, I have the same question that she has, so we're going to go ahead and go to her. Hi. Uh, at the next practice, can someone time how long Drew can go without licking his fingers? <laughs> uh, it, it, it won't be very long, Angel. I promise you that. He does that. Uh, I think he does that just turning the page, too, like if he's in the playbook. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Who that? I've seen it firsthand in the cafeteria. He does it before he gets his fruit. He does it before he gets his salad. It's just, I don't know what it is, but he does it often. I love Jeff, it. Jeff, anything else to add before we let you go? No, look, I just appreciate everybody's support. Uh, stay healthy out there and um, go Raging Cajuns.